Brothers, it is good to be with you. It is a joy and a privilege. Uh, I'm grateful for this institution, uh, for this local church, uh, for Dr. Busnitz, Dr. Duncan, and of course, uh, Pastor John. Uh, There are so many men that have poured into me, and I'm indebted to the ministry that they participated in, in allowing me to grow as first a a Christian, a husband, a father, and a churchman in that order. Uh, I know you're coming off of world-renowned preaching with Shepherd's Conference, and I want to let you know that none of those preachers could stay, so instead you have me. Um, And naturally, when you preach to men who are expositors, Uh, There is an element of intimidation, but my desire and objective this morning is to truly serve you in a unique way. Uh, For me to remind you of the truth that you already know, that your handling of the word, your ability to cut straight scripture is not a general idea, it's not theory, it's not high in the sky conceptual, but it exists for you to serve people in their highest moments, in their lowest moments, and everything in between. What you are doing matters, and your theology matters, and I want to show you that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 14. And I would invite you to read the text with me. We'll pray and then we'll begin to unpack this portion of Scripture. Uh, Though we'll read verses 13 to 18, we will focus primarily on verses 13 and 14. Uh, We read from God's Word, Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Thessalonica, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the, sound, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these Words, Father, we ask you uh, to use your word mightily to minister to these dear brothers, uh, whether they're in a season of plenty or in a season of pain. Uh, would you use this text to minister to their hearts as well as equip them uh, to be ministers of your word to others who may be grieving? Uh, We need your grace, and we humbly rely on you. We pray all these in Christ's precious name. Amen. Uh, Winchester Castle is something that you may or may not be familiar with. It's roughly 90 miles away from where I live in Sacramento, uh, from L.A. It's about 340 miles away from you. And for a fee, you can visit it and learn and experience its unique history. Uh, The original builder was Sarah Winchester, the widow of William Winchester, heir to the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Uh, The Winchester rifle was considered to be the gun that had won the West. And this mansion of this widow took almost 40 years to build. She started in the 1880s, and Sarah Winchester purchased this small unfinished farmhouse, and she began to build it out. She hired workers to labor nonstop, transforming this tiny little cottage into a seven-story mansion that had strange architecture. Rooms were added to exterior walls. 
resulting in windows overlooking other rooms. You had multiple staircases that were added that differed in size in their risers, giving each staircase this distorted look. There was no consistency whatsoever. There were certain staircases that would ascend several levels and then end abruptly. Some of the staircases led right into the ceiling. Uh, There would be doors that would open to solid walls out of these 2,000 doors in this mansion, not all led to where you would expect. One even opened up to a sheer 15-foot drop into an outdoor garden. 161 rooms, 47 fireplaces, 10,000 panes of glass, two basements, and three elevators. And Sarah loved the number 13. She was obsessed with it. 13 paned windows, 13 paneled ceilings, as well as 13 step stairways. She had 13 bathrooms, and only one of them was actually functional. Why would she do this? Well, Miss Winchester, newly in possession of a massive fortune, struggling with the loss of her husband and daughter, sought the advice of a medium. She hoped perhaps to get advice from beyond as to how to spend her fortune and what to do with her life. And the story goes that this medium was able to channel her departed husband, William, who advised Sarah to leave her home, head out west to California, and build a for- use her fortune to build this house for the spirits that had died due to the Winchester gun so that they would not torment her the rest of her days. These contractors who worked on the house reported that she would have daily engagement through mediums and and these spirits would tell her how to appease them by building these illogical additions to the house. She processed death and grief through building this wonky castle. But she's not the only one. We go to a place in a remote region in Indonesia where people mummify bodies of those who die for days after their death, and and they begin to care for these bodies as if they're still alive. They they bathe the body, they feed the body, they clothe the corpse, they even place lit cigarettes in their mouths to give the person a taste of the things that they may have enjoyed if they were still alive. This body is buried, a stone covers this uh, burial cave, and every year the corpse is brought out, clean, dressed, and fed, and reburied as a way for the living to remember the dead. It doesn't stop there. A man in Japan sets up a, a wind telephone, which is just an empty telephone booth, and people can pick up this phone and begin to talk with their deceased relatives through this phone, and the wind will carry the message to them. Uh, Brothers, we know that every culture seems to have a plethora of ideas about what happens to a person when he or she dies. Some don't believe in a life after death. Some believe in different versions of reincarnation. Some have a mix and match approach to it. And even believers at times don't fully understand and are confused. The church in Thessalonica is struggling. These believers in this city don't fully understand, and they're distressed, and they're sorrowful. And the Apostle Paul's desire is for them to learn what it means to grieve well, for them to understand death, for them to be infused with hope, to press on faithfully, for them not to grasp for answers in the dark, but go to the revealed word of the Lord. Oh, the pain of grief can be profound, but we praise God for the clarity that is in his word that allows us as Christians to understand what happens next. And you, as ministers of the word and the gospel, are conduits of that. Just as Paul is trying to change the Thessalonians' thinking, you, in your ministry, will use the theology that you learn to change your people's thinking as well. This is a minister that wants to care for his flock. And he's been really encouraging thus far. The first three chapters, if you've read this letter, which I know you have, it's very upbeat and positive. The first three chapters, there are no words of correction or rebuke. 
But yet we know that this church is young in their faith and they're challenged to excel still more. While the church had an amazing beginning, now there are some unique challenges where Apostle Paul has to remind them to excel still more. That the the premise of the book is in order for the Thessalonians to stand firm in the present, they have to think about the steadfast hope that they have when it comes to the future. That that the gospel and Jesus' return will shape how they live their lives today. Paul, according to Acts 17, was forced to depart from Thessalonica against his will. He desired to return, but the city officials prohibited his return. He sent Timothy as a representative, and Timothy's report had identified deficiencies in the church. Specifically, look at chapter 3, verse 10. Paul says, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. He wants to supply that which is lacking. So thus far, as we parachute into this portion of scripture, he's reminded them that their life is pleasing to the Lord. He's told them to excel still more. He's challenged them to sexual purity, brotherly love, and now he's going to deal with grief, specifically those who have already died in Christ. And what we've read in verses 13 to 18 is new content for the Thessalonians. If you look at chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, you keep doing that. You've received that from us. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write. To you, for you yourselves have been taught. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. There are certain things that they already knew that Paul and others have already taught them. But here in verse 13 of chapter 4, he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed. There's something that they needed clarity on. There were certain believers that were dying in their midst and they were concerned about them. That they were too preoccupied and concerned about the day of the Lord. And what Paul is doing in this text is he's helping them rethink certain things. He's, He's transforming their thinking on three specific matters that I want us to unpack in order for you then to see your role as a minister of the gospel, that that you, knowing the theology that you know, preaching the word that you preach, will help believers in your midst think differently than the rest of the world does. Paul reminds or teaches these Christians and reminds us that, number one, grief has been transformed. A grief has been transformed. Transformed. Look again at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. You're lacking in this knowledge, and I want to fill that which is lacking. I want to clarify certain things, and it seems like the Thessalonians are distraught. We don't exactly know why they're distraught, but we can somewhat piece it together that they are waiting for the imminent return of Jesus. Paul stresses that in verses 15 and 17 of chapter 4. And Paul actually uses the pronoun we, that, that Paul himself is waiting for the imminent return of Christ. He doesn't know exactly when it's going to happen. The Thessalonians don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And just like the last MacArthur Center podcast, we know that there are certain individuals that are trying to predict it and say that it is going to happen on this day. It was funny to know that the day that Harold Camping promised the rapture would happen was the day that I was graduating from Sac State with my undergrad, and I I still went. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be raptured in a robe, looking like a Presbyterian preacher, that would be ironic and kind of funny. The imminent return of Jesus is exactly that. It's imminent, and they were waiting for it, as Paul was, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
And the Thessalonians, they are preoccupied. They're excelling still more. They're laboring for the Lord, but some members of the church are dying. Whether it's natural or most likely due to persecution, as Paul references in chapter 2, verse 14, what happens to those who have died of Jesus' returns? We're waiting for the imminent return, and those of us who are alive are an advantage because Jesus is going to come back. But what about those who have died? And it's so easy for us to see this as a text that we use as a proof text for our eschatology and the rapture. But, but the reason why I strategically chose this passage for us this morning is because though, yes, the, there is the truth of the rapture here, the snatching away, the church being taken, the, the details, even though they are important and, and our necessity of understanding the details is because we as pastors are then to inform others who need their grief transformed. This text is not just there to satisfy our curiosity about the last things. Its purpose is to encourage those who are facing the most profound grief that a human could experience, the loss of a loved one. This text, even though it often finds its place in the, the, the scholastic academic realm, this text, where it really finds its life, is at the funeral home and at the burial site. And at the hospital, when someone is breathing their last breath, if you've buried a loved one, this text is for you. If you're ministering to someone that has lost someone, this text is for you. I've studied 1 Corinthians 15 in the classroom, but when that text was read by my mother's bedside as she was in hospice dying from stage 4 cancer, it resonated in a completely different way. Oh, these believers need their grief to be transformed. Paul says, I, I want you not to grieve. I want you not to be sad or distressed or have this emotional distress as the world word could be translated. And, and you know this word, this word grief. When the news comes, your, your stomach turns. It feels like a fog has come upon you. Hard to think, numbness, pain, tears, doubts, frustration, uncertainty. And what I love about Apostle Paul is he doesn't condemn their grief. He doesn't say, stop grieving. You know that God is sovereign and all things will work out for your good and his glory. He doesn't say that, oh, as, as Christians, you're not supposed to grieve because non-believers grieve. We know that that idea isn't biblical because believers grieve. Job grieves. David mourns Saul and Jonathan's death in 2 Samuel 1. Our Lord and Savior was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Oh, a grieving Savior is great comfort to grieving people because only a grieving Savior can bring light to the seemingly endless darkness of grief. Oh, brothers, we do need to grieve and we need to teach others how to grieve, but look what Paul says. May you not grieve as others do who have no hope. The reference there, the others, the rest, verse 12, outsiders, non-believers, the world. And we know that the world doesn't know how to grieve. We know the world tries to grieve. I read this article, uh, Psychology Today article, pardon me for quoting it, uh, quoting with the death of a friend, a few tips if you're mourning the, the loss of a friend. Number one, surround yourself with a circle of support. So you need loved ones around you. Another tip is accept not having an answer. And here's a quote. It's natural to ask the question why over and over again. Unfortunately, there isn't an answer to the why question. In life, bad things happen to good people. And this is especially true when someone has passed away. Part of the healing process is learning to find ways to deal with the unknown and accepting that there will never be an answer. Another tip, comfort yourself in your sorrow. Here's another quote. Comforting yourself is doing something nurturing and kind that helps you feel better. It's the little things that can really help calm, ease, and settle your discomfort. 
Life's small comforts can even make hard times more manageable. Comforting can come from baking homemade cookies, snuggling with a favorite blanket. As small as these things may seem, they will help you feel better. That's what the world says. Surround yourself with loved ones. You'll never know any answers. Bake some cookies and get under a soft blanket. That's how you grieve. That's why people build houses and dig up bodies and say rest in peace and that they're in a better place. That's why the author of Hebrews in chapter 2.15 says, those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. But it is not this way with Christians. For our grief is to be transformed. It is not an ignoring of the pain. It is redeeming our pain. Paul does not ridicule them for their grief. He lovingly guides them to sanctify their grief, to grieve not like the world. Uh, John Calvin on this text says, Paul does not, however, forbid us altogether to mourn, but requires moderation in our mourning. And Chrysostom says, Weep then at the death of a dear one as if, You are bidding farewell to one setting out on a journey. Paul does not want them and us to be uninformed because he wants us to be comforted. Brothers, we must be prepared to grieve well and serve those in our local churches to grieve well by transforming their grief. You might say, well, how? How do we transform one's grief? We get to our second heading because the idea of death has been transformed. Our grief can be transformed because the idea of death has been transformed. Look, brothers, we know that death is the the ultimate equalizer, the great equalizer. And everyone tries to avoid it to some degree. Right? You, you avoid it by not smoking, not drinking. You cut back on salt. You watch your diet in general. You know, kale it up, couscous, all that good stuff in order to be healthy. Make sure your blood pressure is good. Exercise regularly. Routine checkups, which men don't do unless our wives force us to. You practice risk mitigation. Some avoid flying to mitigate risk, especially on Spirit Airlines. You don't do extreme sports. You, you drive slower. Why? Why take all these measures? Because we know that death can be scary. The unknown can be scary. But look at the word that Paul uses to describe death. Three times in verses 13, 14, and 15, those who are asleep, verse 14, those who have fallen asleep, verse 15, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. I don't know about you, but if someone offers me sleep, I I like that idea, especially you on a Tuesday morning chapel. You like the concept of sleep right now. Euphemism sounds enticing, and we use euphemisms all the time, right? The car isn't used, it's certified pre-owned. She's not sick, she's under the weather. He's not a liar, he's just creative with the truth. He didn't get fired, I'm just in between jobs. Sorry that your loved one has died, we don't say that. Sorry that your loved one has passed away. Is, Is Paul trying to just soften up this concept of death. No, because this word is a theological word. This idea of sleep, this this peaceful, calm, laying down on a comfortable pillow, cozy as you drift off peacefully. Sleep as the body lays down, it means that there is going to come a day where it will be woken back up. Sleep is never final. It's always temporary. And in verse 14, when Paul says those who have fallen asleep, he uses this passive participle. 
it's very graphic, this idea that them that were put to sleep, these individuals were, were put to sleep. One commentator says the very act of dying is compared to putting to sleep as with a child whom his mother hushes to slumber. God puts them to sleep, puts their bodies to sleep. Reminding us that though we, we often think that death is irreversible in its reality, at least the world does, for our Lord and Savior Jesus, it is just sleep. That's why he says in Mark 5 to Jairus that his little girl is just sleeping. Because he has the power to raise that body up. It was temporary. And these Thessalonians are going to be taught that there is this bodily resurrection that will take place when the rapture happens. Does it mean that their soul is asleep? Absolutely not. We, we know this truth. We can go to Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, but you'll say, well, that's just a parable. That doesn't uh, condemn the idea of soul sleep. What about the thief on the cross? When Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise, you can look at Stephen in Acts 7 as he delivers up his spirit to the Lord Jesus, and the text tells us that he fell asleep. 760, Paul in Philippians 123 says, absent from the body and present with the Lord. Christians, though, when they die, their bodies go into the grave. We know that their spirit goes directly into the presence of God, the intermediate state, not the final state. And there will come a day where the rapture will take place. The, the, the glorified bodies will be renewed with the spirit, the tribulation, the thousand year millennial kingdom, and then the new heavens and the new earth. And all of that is future. But Paul is reminding them that those who have already fallen asleep are not at a disadvantage. It is those who are still alive that are at a disadvantage. For those who have fallen asleep are already in the presence of Christ, their Lord and Savior. So brothers, do you know that the English word cemetery is taken from the Greek word which means a sleeping place? It's a place where the bodies are laid to rest in order then to be woken back up. You might say, well, where's the, where's the example? Where, where's, the, where's the illustration in all of this? How can we be sure that this takes place? Because we see that in verse 14, that Jesus died and he rose again. That, that he has the power over death. And as a result, for the believer, it is not a disadvantage to die. I know this is a lengthy quote, but bear with me as I quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words. He writes, Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear it. Death is not wild and terrible if only we can be still and hold fast to God's word. Death is not bitter if we have not become bitter ourselves. Death is grace. The greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet and gentle. It beckons us with heavenly power. If only we realize that it is the gateway to our homeland. The tabernacle of joy. The everlasting kingdom of peace. Oh, how do we know that dying is so dreadful? Who knows whether in our human fear and anguish we are only shivering and shuddering at the most glorious, heavenly, blessed event in the world. Death is hell and night and cold if it is not transformed by our faith. But that is just what is so marvelous that we can transform death because it is a revelation from the Lord himself, Paul says in verse 15, that God's word reminds us that when we die, we sleep, and as a result of that truth, our grief can be transformed. Our view of death can be transformed. And third and finally, that means that our hope can be transformed. Our, our hope can be transformed. 
We have to see something very important in verse 14. Look what Paul does. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. It's a conditional sentence. For if we believe, and as a result of what we believe in, there is a promise that, uh, a matter of fact, something will take place. This conditional sentence is guaranteed. In the Greek, it is a must. It will take place. And, and it is rooted, that the promise that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep is rooted in gospel truth. Front half of verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We can be sure that God will bring us to heaven. He will raise our bodies because of Jesus' atoning death and victorious resurrection. Oh, the hope that we have is not pie in the sky. It's rooted in the person and the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I read a while back about a man and his wife and cranky mother-in-law going on vacation to the Holy Land, to Israel. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for around $5,000, or you can have her buried for a fraction of that cost in the Holy Land. And the man thought about it for a while and told the undertaker that he would just have her shipped home and the undertaker asked why why would you spend all that money to ship her when she could be buried here and in the in the holy land and the man responded a man died here about 2,000 years ago he was buried here and three days later he rose from the dead I just can't take that chance historical fact of the death and resurrection of Jesus promises that we as believers will experience our own resurrection. That it's historical reality. 1 Corinthians 15, it's factual. It was promised that Jesus would come, that he would die, that he would be raised. It was done and it was witnessed. All of this is rooted in history. It's not simple faith. It's, it's reasonable faith. And the beauty here is that we know as men of the book that death is a result of sin. That the serpent said, surely you will not die. And when Adam and Eve rebel, death enters into the world. They are cast out east of Eden, no longer having access to the tree of life. From dust they come and from dust they will return. So naturally the sting of death is sin. But if we believe that Jesus paid for that sin, there is no longer sting in that death. When someone dies, we have to go back to the fundamentals that Jesus accomplished something for us that we could not accomplish on our own. And that by the means of his death, we are now delivered from God's wrath and brought into God's kingdom. Look, I, I might be reading a little too much into this, but I, I, I see it in the text, so bear with me. Paul says in verse 13, 14, and 15, those who have fallen asleep. He uses that beautiful euphemism, fallen asleep. This is cozy word that we like. But when he talks about Jesus' death, he does not say in verse 14 that he fell asleep. Instead, he says Jesus died. Jesus died. That, that Jesus absorbed the full wrath of a holy God on that tree. That he had to endure that pain and that turmoil in order for us to enjoy sleep. He died so that we brothers could sleep. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And when Jesus screamed in pain, we can now sing praises. 
When he absorbed the wrath of a holy God, we can enjoy the presence of this holy God. Jesus did in six hours what would have taken an eternity in hell away from the fellowship of God for us. In his death, he brought death to death. He died under the wrath of the Father so that when our loved ones and friends in Christ are lowered into the ground, and you as ministers, when you minister to those people, you can say, they went to sleep. Donald Gray Barnhouse, pastor of the historic 10th Presbyterian Church in Philly for 33 years, uh, lost his first wife to cancer. And you might be familiar with this illustration. Uh, as he was driving home from her funeral uh, with his four young children in the back seat, Struggling with pain and grief, he knew that he needed to say some words to comfort the kiddos. And there was a large moving van truck that passed right next to their car in downtown, casting this massive shadow onto the car. And Barnhouse, being the master of a preacher that he was, an illustrator, he said to the kids, children, would you rather be run over by a truck or by its shadow? And the children said, well, of course, Dad, we'd rather be run over by the shadow. That can't hurt us at all. And Barnhouse replied, did you know that 2,000 years ago, the truck of death ran over Lord, our Lord Jesus in order that only its shadow might now run over us. Oh, it is not only his death. Oh, if, if he stays in the grave, that's not enough. But Paul reminds us that the proof of our redemption is in his resurrection. That, that the agency of Jesus and our union with Jesus, right? For, look at verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, Jesus is the, the agent and the channel that then God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. It is our union with Christ that guarantees that we will be raised by his power. Uh, for Jesus rose and in the same way he will resurrect us. Paul concludes this portion, this pericope, with this beautiful reminder in verse 17. And so we will always be with the Lord. And then he tells them, therefore, encourage one another with these words. We'll always be with him in life and death in the intermediate state and when he raises us from the dead at the rapture. Brothers, what a gospel. Brothers, what a savior. Brothers, what a plan. What a hope. Oh, so when those around us go to sleep, we grieve and we minister to those who are grieving but what great joy that we have that we do so not with building a mansion or mummifying bodies or creating channels to speak to them. But we grieve as those who have hope because Jesus died, rose, and it is through him that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. When you go to that Greek class, when you go to that Hebrew class, that theology class, that hermeneutics class, that PM class, oh dear friend, you are not just learning scholastic theory. Oh, you are learning about the truth that gives life so that then God can use you as ministers to care for others in their highest moment or in their lowest moment of grief and everything in between. So may you be encouraged. May you not lose heart. And may you see that what you are investing in now matters. Father, we thank you for this reminder.
that those of us who've placed our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that when our time comes, we shall sleep because he died. Oh, as these brothers go their way, may they realize that the things that they learn in that eschatology class is not just scholarship. They will be used in the funeral home, at the burial site, and in that hospital room, pointing their people to a glorious Savior who died and rose so that we might live in him, in whose name we pray. Amen.